Hi everyone and welcome to our video on some exam questions related to structure and bonding. Our first exam question states, figure 1 shows the outer electrons in an atom of the group 1 element potassium and in an atom of the group 6 element sulfur. Potassium forms an ionic compound with sulfur. Describe what happens when two atoms of potassium react with one atom of sulfur and give your answer in terms of electron transfer. And you need to give the formula of the ions which are involved. So we have potassium, which is a metal, reacting with sulfur, which is a non-metal. Okay, that's why it's forming an ionic bond. Now potassium is in group 1. So it's going to have a positive charge. So that's the symbol and it's going to have a positive charge because it's in group 1 and it's a metal. Okay. Sulfur is in group 6. And it has 6 electrons in its outer shell as you can see here. It needs 2 electrons to have a full outer shell. That's why sulfur is going to have a two negative charge because it needs two electrons to gain a full outer energy level okay so potassium is going to transfer its outer shell electron to sulfur so potassium is going to transfer its outer shell electron to sulfur and this is so potassium now has a full outer shell now if one of them is transferred to sulfur that's not going to be enough because sulfur requires two electrons to have a full outer shell so you need two potassium atoms so you need two potassium atoms to satisfy one sulfur so after it's lost an electron it's going to have it's uh, it's going to become an ion which is charged and it's going to have a positive charge and sulfur will become a two minus ion because it needs two more electrons now potassium, two of these potassium atoms will transfer two electrons to sulfur, so sulfur has its full outer shell. Now when they react with each other, they will form potassium sulfide. Now potassium sulfide is K and how many atoms of potassium do we need? We need two to satisfy one sulfur okay and sulfur is two negative potassium is a positive and as you can see the opposites are the same okay and that there will give you five marks okay next question the structure of potassium sulfide can be represented using the ball and stick model in figure 2. The ball and stick model is not a true representation of the structure of potassium sulfide. Give one reason why. Well, the ball and stick diagram represents the potassium and sulfide ions, but as you can see, they've attached the ions with sticks. Now, that's not the true representation because in the true representation, they don't actually have sticks. Okay? So, the there are no sticks in the real one there are no sticks there are no sticks attaching the potassium and sulfide ions okay and that will get you one mark
okay the next question sulfur can also form covalent bonds complete the dot and cross diagram to show the covalent bonding in a molecule of hydrogen sulfide so we're given two hydrogens and one sulfur now sulfur needs two electrons to have a full outer shell so it gains those two from hydrogen so hydrogen needs one and shares one okay so each of them will share one electron and then sulfur will give them one electron as well because they need one to have a full outer shell so sulfur will share two electrons one for each hydrogen and sulfur originally had six okay so one two three four five six okay so sulfur originally had six electrons you can see that by the red dots and now hydrogen have given them one each so now sulfur has a full outer shell and hydrogen has a full outer energy level as well that would get you two marks okay next question it says calculate the relative formula mass of aluminium sulfate and we're given the relative atomic masses there so remember the relative formula mass is the sum of the relative atomic masses so let's work out aluminium we have two atoms of aluminium so we're going to do 27 multiplied by 2 which is 54 and then we have three lots of sulfate so it's going to be s plus 16 times 4 which is 64 so it's going to be 64 plus 32 and you can just work that out that's going to give you 96 and we have three lots of sulfate so you're going to multiply this by 3 okay so 96 multiplied by 3 would get you 288 and then you can add that onto the aluminium 288 add 54 and that would get you 342 for two marks okay next question covalent compounds such as hydrogen sulfide have low melting points and do not conduct electricity when molten draw one line from each property to explain uh, to the explanation of the property so we have the property and then we have the explanation so low melting point what does that mean well that means that there are weak intermolecular forces of attraction which means less energy is required to break the bonds so you would just match that up to there and does not conduct electricity when molten if it does not conduct ele uh, electricity there are no charged particles which are free to move okay you would just join that up there and that would get you two marks similar question ionic compounds such as potassium sulfide have high boiling points and conduct electricity when when dissolved in water draw one line from each property to the explanation of the property okay so this time we have the opposite we have high boiling point and conduct electricity when molten so high boiling point what does that mean that that tells us that the bonds are strong that means more energy is required to break them resulting in a high boiling point and conducts electricity when molten that means the ions not the electrons the ions are free to move and carry a charge okay that would get you two marks okay next question this question is about halogens and their compounds the table below shows the boiling points and properties of some of the elements in group 7 of the periodic table why does iodine have a higher boiling point than chlorine so iodine is lower down in the group compared to chlorine why does it have a higher boiling point well because it's talking about boiling point that tells you that it's going to be related to the forces it's going to be related to how strong the forces are um, between the molecules of iodine so the answer would be that one there the forces between iodine molecules are stronger 
now it can't be the first three only because the iodine is lower down in the group and remember it has a greater boiling point which means more energy is required to break the forces between the molecules it's not the covalent bonds between the iodine atoms it's the molecules which are strongly attracted in the iodine um, molecules that would get you one mark it says predict the boiling point of bromine so you can see a trend going down here as you go down the group the boiling point increases or gets higher so you could have had a range of answers over here not too close to chlorine and not too close to iodine so i would say over here boiling point in degrees i would put in a hundred a hundred degrees okay and that would get you one mark next question a redox reaction takes place when aqueous chlorine is added uh, is added to potassium iodide solution the equation for the reaction is given there look at the table above what is the color of the final solution in this reaction as you can see iodine is being produced and if we go up what color is iodine iodine is brown so what's the final uh, color of the solution it's brown and that would get you one mark what is the ionic equation for the reaction of chlorine with potassium iodide so remember if we're reacting potassium iodide with chlorine we want the ionic equation the ionic equation is not going to contain potassium because potassium is a constant it's going to be there on both sides of the reaction so we're not going to include potassium we're just going to include iodine and chlorine so we have potassium iodide reacting with chlorine remember ionic equation shows the charges so we can rule out the first one and it has to have iodine and chlorine in it and not potassium because potassium is the metal which is going to be there on both sides of the equation so we can rule out the last one so we have the middle two left we're looking at potassium iodide with chlorine so potassium iodide and reacting with chlorine chlorine is going to be cl2 and potassium iodide as it's reacting it's going to be an ion it's going to be an ion so it's going to have a charge so we know it's going to be the second one because chlorine is going to have a formula of cl2 and iodine is reacting with potassium so it's going to have a charge so it's going to be i minus plus cl2 and that will get you one mark okay next question why does potassium iodide solution conduct electricity so if it conducts electricity it's not the electrons which can move it's the ions which can move so just general knowledge there that would get you one mark what are the products of electrolyzing potassium iodide solution so potassium iodide solution because it's solution we also have hydrogen which are positively charged and hydroxide ions which are negatively charged okay now remember at the cathode it's going to be either hydrogen or copper silver gold and at the anode it's either going to be hydroxide or a halogen now as you can see iodide is a halogen it's in group seven so we know that we're going to produce iodine at the anode at the cathode do we have copper silver gold no we don't because we have potassium which is more reactive than hydrogen so what's going to happen is hydrogen and iodine is going to be produced um, as the products of electrolysis that would be worth one mark okay next question gold is mixed with other metals to make jewelry the figure below shows the composition of different carat values of gold what is the percentage of gold in 12 carat gold now as you can see we have 9 carat and we have 18 carat we don't have 
12 karat gold okay so we need to work it out so as you can see over here in the 18 karat we have 75 percent of the metal which is gold okay so in 18 karat there's 75 percent which is gold so in 12 karat we need to work out how much is going to be gold so 18 karat we have 75 percent which is gold 12 karat we need to work out what the percentage is so if you use your maths and work it out you would get that 12 karat would be 50 percent so 50 percent is the answer there for one mark give the percentage of silver in 18 karat gold use the figure above to answer this question so remember this is silver ag the striped one and it goes from 75 percent to 80 percent so the difference is five percent so the percentage of silver in 18 karat gold is five percent for one mark final question it says suggest two reasons why nine karat gold is often used instead of pure gold to make jewelry now if we look at the model over here nine karat and 18 karat as you can see nine karat uses less gold that means it's going to be less expensive so nine karat gold is often used because it's less expensive because less gold is used that would be your first point and your second point well if you have a look now 18 karat has a lot of gold in it however in 9 karat there's a small amount of gold and a large amount of copper in it now in 9 karat that means it's an alloy gold is an alloy in nine carat because it contains a short amount of gold a small amount of gold and it contains a large amount of copper so that means that nine carat is going to be harder so nine carat is going to be harder and the reason is because gold is used as an alloy because we only have a small amount of gold in nine carat and that would be worth two marks and that is it for this video thanks for watching i hope you liked it and one last thing please subscribe hit the like button and the notification bell